Thank you. Well, it's so good to see you uh, today, and uh, thank you for being here. Yes, this is the uh, 59th uh, celebration, our 59th uh, anniversary of the founding of HBU in 1960. So uh, we do have a very special program today, and, and you're going, as Salim has said, to be blessed by it. I want to mention two initiatives that relate to Kay Warren, today's uh, speaker for you, uh, but two initiatives that we have here at the university, just briefly mention them. Uh, recently, we have started the Global Center for Mental Health Care and Ministry, the Global Center for Mental Health Care and Ministry. It's uh, located in the College of Education and Behavioral Sciences. It relates to uh, the, the dramatic needs that we have in our culture for, for trained professionals, for, for a curriculum, uh, for those who can, can deal with the growing problems of, uh, of mental health care. Uh, in our society. So the Global Center for Mental Health Care and Ministry, you can take courses uh, online or here residentially. And then also the other initiative is that we've started the, the Gideon Institute. The Gideon Institute is, is uh, another academic enterprise that actually is not only academic but also clinical. Uh, it works to integrate uh, Christian faith uh, with psychology. It is uh, Christ-centered uh, uh, psychology and worldview and counseling. It is Christ-centered, it's biblically based, and it's uh, clinically informed. So the Gideon uh, Institute has started a uh, couple of master's degrees programs this, this past fall, and also we have begun uh, not only to, to train uh, Christian counselors, uh, but also, uh, in fact, to provide uh, Christian counseling through the Gideon Institute. So when you hear those, those uh, uh, programs, uh, you'll, you'll know at least a, a smattering of what we're talking about. Today, it's my great privilege to introduce to you Kay Warren. She and her husband, Rick, are the co-founders of the, of the very famous uh, and world internationally known Saddleback Church in California. Uh, she has, uh, they have a remarkable testimony about the grace of God with respect to the ministry of that church, not only in California, but uh, nationwide and, uh, and worldwide. She's a grandmother, a mother, a wife. She has uh, uh, authored numerous books. She speaks all over the country and all over the world. Uh, the book that I found most uh, interesting with respect to its title uh, is Choose Joy Because Happiness Isn't Enough. That's, uh, it, the title itself is, is something to think about. Uh, today, uh, Ms. Warren is going to share a very personal story uh, about uh, their son Matthew and the experience there, the tragedy there in their own, in their own family, and why she believes, uh, as all of us do, that we must all participate in mental health awareness, not only with respect to ourselves and our own needs, but also uh, those around us. After Ms. Warren speaks, uh, then we're going to have a brief uh, Q&A uh, session together uh, here on the platform. But join me now. Would you please welcome to this platform, Kay Warren. Thank you so much. Good morning. It is an honor to be with you. I'm going to move that out of the way. It is an honor to be with you today. If I could take a poll of those of you that are here and those of you that are watching online, and I could ask you, what is the word that most likely describes you right now? As a college student, university student, um, some of you might say, you might think the word would be excited, or maybe the word bored, <laughs> or, um, you know, if you're being really honest, or, um, you know, optimistic, or maybe you would say busy. But actually, studies say that the word that most college students would say represents their life is the word anxious. About 60% of college students report that in the last year, they experienced an overwhelming anxiety. Another word that's commonly used by a lot of college students is the word depressed. About a third of college students report that they have experienced terrible depression in the last year. So depressed that they felt like they couldn't even function. And the number two killer of students your age, 18 to 24, is suicide in the United States. And while almost all colleges offer counseling services and psychological services, um, college students are notoriously the worst. For actually seeking help. And that tells me that many of you today really are struggling, that it 
it really doesn't matter how good you look on the outside, how together you appear, how much it seems like you're doing well with your studies and in your relationships, and maybe some of you are working as well, you're doing sports, you're walking with God, it really doesn't matter how good, it, how good you look from the outside, how put together you seem, how well it seems like your life is going. If we believe these statistics, then there's a lot going on under the waterline in your life, things that most of us can't see. And in fact, some of you might say things like this to yourself, I hate myself. I don't matter. I don't fit in. I want to give up. I feel useless. And rather than try to minimize those feelings and just try to give you a pep talk, tells you, you know, to stop thinking that way, which of course is not a very helpful approach ever, I'd like to spend a few minutes just talking about something that I think is much stronger than that, and it's how to build or maybe rebuild hope in your life to counteract those negative feelings, those negative emotions, those negative things that you might be saying to yourself, those things that can be overwhelming at times. But I have to be honest with you because hope sometimes feel like it's this fluffy, bedazzled thing when actually hope can actually feel very risky. Hope can actually be a bit of a dangerous, risky feeling because what if you put all your efforts one more time into therapy or a new medication and you don't get any better? What if you risk opening up to a friend or a family member and they get angry or they get frightened at what you tell them? Or what if they just kind of like, oh, get over yourself. You are such a drama queen or you are such a drama king. What if they tell you things like that and leave you worse off than you were before you took the risk of sharing? How many times can you really try hard to change, to stop using to stop cutting, to stop thinking those thoughts, but you can't. How many times can you just get your hopes up only to see them lying on the floor in pieces on the ground? My son Matthew lived with serious depression and anxiety for most of his life since he was a little tiny boy. And in childhood, it was manageable because as the mom, I was kind of in charge. I made sure that he saw his doctors. I made sure that he was getting good treatment. I was making sure that he took his medications. I mean, that's what I did as a mom. But as he grew older and he became your age, part of the feature of his illness was he didn't really believe that any kind of treatment helped him, that it was worthwhile, or that there was any reason to keep trying, and his life became this gigantic battle every day for hope. And eventually, as um, Dr. Sloan mentioned, the seriousness of his untreated illness led to his death six years ago by suicide. And I think that's part why, why I am so passionate for you, why I care so deeply about you, and why I want to say to encourage you to take anxiety and depression seriously so that hope can also become a strong, protective, and stabilizing power in your life. And I want to share with you a concept that I think that might could help. But it doesn't come with a 30-day money-back refund. It doesn't come with a guarantee that if you follow these things that I'm going to be talking to you about, that, man, everything is going to work out great in your life. I wouldn't say that to you, and I wouldn't do that to you. Because honestly, we sometimes as Christians get in such a big hurry to take our problems and tie them with this big bow and say, there's the problem that I used to have. When in actuality, this life is hard. It's hard. And if we ever needed hope, really solid, strong, gritty, based on realism hope, it's today. I call it the hope circle. And you can jump in on it at any point in time, but there is a beginning point to it. There are five hope-filled statements that counterbalance and counteract those negative messages that all of us say to ourselves at least every once in a while. So let me start. 
the first thing, let me go back to those statements that I said some of you could be thinking. A lot of people say, I hate myself. But I want to tell you that hope and God say, you are loved. The statement that is true. Because I don't think that there's anybody that hasn't at some point in their lives stood in front of a mirror and said, you are such a screw up. I hate you. You can't ever get it right. No matter how many times you try, no matter how hard, how much effort, man, you are just one giant mess up. And we hate ourselves. My son used to say that all the time, and another word for that is called self-loathing. It's, it's a loathing of yourself, not so much for what you do, although there's plenty of times that we have a lot of deep regret and a lot of deep feelings about some of the things that we do that we know aren't helpful or that aren't good or that are absolutely wrong. But this is more deeper than that. It's about not what you do, but about who you are. And a loathing, hatred of yourself because of who you think you are. And God's response, you are loved. God's response to your statements of self-loathing or self-hatred is every single minute of every single day, you are loved. The hope circle starts with that. You're loved. Max Lucado says, I can fathom a God who knows me and who made me, who hears me, but a God who is in love with me, a God who is crazy about me, but that's the message of the Bible. Our Father is relentlessly in pursuit of his children. Isaiah 54, 10 God says, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has what? Hatred for you? Judgment for you? Anger for you? Says the God who has compassion on you. Isaiah 43, 4, God again speaking, he says, because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. What is at the root of self-loathing? Often it's shame. And we don't like to talk about shame because we're ashamed to talk about the fact that we have shame. And so we don't talk about the fact that we often feel full of shame. And it's kind of crazy. But the truth of this hope of that God loves you is that no matter what you've done and who you've done it with and how many times you've done it or how many times you haven't done what you knew you were supposed to do. The message of God is that I love you. I love you. It doesn't matter how deeply you've disappointed your family. I mean, it matters, but here we're talking about something even deeper than that. So whether you've disappointed your family, whether you've disappointed your friends, whether you feel like you've disappointed your professors or whoever you work for or your, or your coach, like, it doesn't really matter who you've disappointed in this life because at the end of every day, when you lay your head down on the pillow, you need to know that you are loved deeply and permanently, whether it's been a good day, bad day, an ugly day, you are loved. His love, Brennan Manning says, and if you've never read any of Brennan Manning, please do, but he says God's love is never, 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 never based on your performance, never conditioned by our moods of elation or depression. The furious love of God knows no shadow of alteration or change. It's reliable and always tender. So the most profound thing that I can tell you as you begin to build or rebuild hope or stabilize it in your life is that you are loved by God. You might say, is another thing that you feel sometimes, I don't matter. And God and hope say, you have a purpose. This universe can often feel like a very cold and unfriendly place. How many times have I seen this on social media? People talk about the universe as though it is this thing out there, and they describe it as being cold and unfeeling and uncaring. We don't live in a universe that is cold and unfeeling and uncaring meaningless. We live in a universe controlled by God, and we live in a universe where God says every single life has purpose. God says you matter infinitely. Your pain matters. 
Your story matters. Your life matters. Honestly, you guys, I talk to students and people all the time who will tell me, my life just doesn't matter. This, this world is big. I mean, there's billions of people. Who really gives a flying fig about my pain, my story, my life? I am just a tiny little cog in a giant machine called the world or the system or the universe, whatever you, phrases you want to use. And it can minimize who you are and make you feel like you don't really have any meaning and that the world would be better off without you. And hope says, no, you have a purpose. Colossians 1.16, the Bible says, for everything, absolutely everything, and that means you, above and below, visible and invisible, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. You were made by God and for God. And until you understand that, your life will not really make sense. You will be an easy prey to disappointment, to disenchantment, to disillusionment, to cynicism. My husband Rick says that you are not an accident. He says your parents may not have planned you, but God did. There are illegitimate parents, but there are no illegitimate children. You were made for his pleasure, and it gave him great joy to create you. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 4, long before he laid down the earth's foundation, he had us in mind, and he settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. Ephesians 1, 12 to 13 says, it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living, part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. So to believe and begin to believe that your life has mattered, that you matter, that your pain matters, that your story matters, really get to know God. Because believing that there is a purpose for your existence allows you to take a few more steps around the hope circle. Believing you are loved, believing that there's a purpose. You also might say, and this one is so painful, but you might say, I don't fit in. I honestly don't know if there is a more painful human emotion. Harder perhaps than depression, harder perhaps even than shame, harder than anxiety is a sense of not belonging, of not fitting, of feeling like you didn't belong in your family, you don't fit in school, you don't fit in your dorm, you don't fit in the social circles. Man, you just can't crack the code. You have done everything you know to do to be liked, to be admired. Everybody just wants to be wanted. Everybody just wants to feel like they belong someplace. There's some place we fit. When I was growing up, we moved around a lot, changed schools so many times. And I just distinctly remember that feeling of always being the new kid, always being the one who didn't know anybody, always being the one who didn't know the social mores of whatever school I had just plunked myself down into. I just always felt so alone. I remember at college, I struggled with depression and anxiety and some social awkwardness. And I remember in college feeling truly I did this. I would make friends with people on the way to the dining room because the worst thing in the world to me would be to open the door of the, of the um, dining hall, walk in, see circles of people eating, laughing, talking. They all looked like they were having a great time. And then I walked in and felt so out of place. And I would make friends with people on the way to the dining hall just so that I had somebody to sit with. I, I really do have an understanding of some of what that feels like. And to feel, some of you, it even goes beyond that not fitting in your family, not fitting in school, not fitting in the dorm, not fitting in a social crowd. Listen, I know from the things that my son used to tell me, there were moments in which he felt so alienated from the human race that there were times he would say, I don't even fit as a human being. 
And if you have any of those kind of feelings, my heart hurts with yours because there is nothing worse than feeling like you don't fit anywhere. But hope and God say, you belong. You belong. You belong in his family. I can't talk about that without talking about the radical friendship of God because God has friended each one of us we all know, I mean, that's the lingua that we use all the time about friending and how many friends you have, how many likes. That's, we, that's just life. We don't even know how to talk without talking that way. But God friended us first. Romans 5, 8 says that while we were still sinners, still thumbing our nose at God, going the opposite direction of him, that he friended us. Jesus said in John 15, 15, I no longer call you slaves. I call you friend. To be a friend of God is to have the deepest friendship you will ever find in this life. And God has already done it, and he's offered us radical friendship. It's not friendship based on how alike we were, because when he found us, we were going the opposite direction. We were in our filth. We were in our sin. We were in our degradation. We were spiritually dead. God came to us in that condition and said, I accept you just like you are in your degradation, in your sin, in your separation. The fact that you want nothing to do with me. I call you friend. That is profound. It's dramatic. It's mind-blowing that the creator of the universe calls me his friend. Have you ever thought of yourself as Mary, friend of God? Or Samantha, friend of God? Or Derek, friend of God? If you know Jesus Christ, that is a legitimate term you can use. You have been friended by God. He calls us friends, and it's such a personal, personal connection to us. Unfortunately, what we do in friendship, most of us, we look for people who have the same interests that we do. You like baseball? I like baseball. You like Pinterest? I like Pinterest. And so we immediately strike up a, ah, that person has the same interests I do. Or if you meet somebody, and they're just, they're kind of charming, they're friendly, they're open, you think, that's a really likable guy, that's a really likable guy, I could be friends with that person. And we base our friendships on similar interests and whether somebody is likable. But that is not enough to carry you when the bottom falls out underneath you, when stuff goes wrong in your life, when the wheels fall off the bus, having relationships that are just based on likability and similar interests it's not likely those people are going to be there for you in the deepest and your darkest moments. God says, I have friended you, and I expect you to friend each other in the same way that I have friended you. Romans 12, 4 to 5, the Bible says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the other. And in this body, in the body of Christ, each member is valuable. Each member has a place. I'm not saying that we do this very well in church. I'm not going to lie to you and pretend like that your church, maybe where you grew up or maybe where you attend now or maybe where you might attend, I'm not going to lie to you and pretend like you're going to find perfect oneness there. It is not going to happen. This is earth, not heaven. It's made up with a bunch of sinners just like you, frail, fragile, messed up people. But there are forever bonds there, forever connections that go far beyond anything that we experience in any other way, more than any sports team, more than any place you work, more than any school that you'll ever graduate from or attend. The body of Christ has eternal bonds, and whether you have ever fit anywhere in this life, you fit in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 24 to 27 says, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffer with it. Each part, if one is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Moving around the hope circle, you might have said at one point in your life, I want to give up. I can't do it anymore. But hope and God say, you have a choice. You know, 
you and I didn't get to choose the families we were born into. None of us did. None of us had the option of which family we were born into. We didn't choose our skin color. We didn't choose the way our hair is, color of our eyes. We didn't get to choose what point in history we were born. We didn't get to choose the economic status or strata that we were exposed to growing up. We didn't get to choose many of the things that have happened to us, many of the painful the things that have caused suffering in your life, you didn't get to choose. These were things that were done to you, things that you experienced, and you didn't have a lot of choices about a lot of things in your life. That is true. But here's the good news. You and I do get to choose how we respond to the things that have happened to us. We do get to make choices that will move us toward hope, no matter what it is that we've experienced. And you need a very strong support system around you. You need the body of Christ. You need deep friendships. You need a purpose. You need to know that you are loved. But listen, there are some things that nobody else can do for you but you. And that's where you and I have choices. This journey of life, it's arduous. It's tough. It's hard. It can be unrelenting. And listen, every one of us gets weary. Every one of us just get weary sometimes by all the effort that it takes to maintain life, to maintain getting through school, getting through your degree, getting started in a career, getting, starting a family, getting yourself established and all those things. It takes effort and all of us get a little weary. And there really are some of you, particularly if you're living with depression, high level of depression, high levels of anxiety, and studies show, listen, one out of five, every, one out of five in this room is living with serious anxiety or depression or some other mental illness. So listen, if you are particularly struggling with severe depression, severe anxiety, there have to be some times in which you have thought it just would be easier to let go of it all. It would just be easier to not be in this struggle, to not be in this pain, to not face these problems, to not face a future that I don't know how to predict or control, or to, you see things ahead that you think, there's some bad stuff coming. I'm not sure I've got what it takes. I really want to tell you that I understand how attractive that can feel sometimes as an option. My son Matthew lived for many years with chronic suicidal thoughts, chronic suicidality. It was not just a passing thing that came and went. He lived with chronic thoughts of suicide. But he also told me that there were times that the dark moments would pass, that they didn't stay there forever, and the intensity can go up and down. If the intensity goes up and down for you, you of all people really, really need to get connected with other people who can help you walk through those darker moments and holding on when it just would be so much easier to let go is difficult, and I have so much respect for you. In the Christian world, we have not always had respect for people who live with depression. In fact, through the ages, through the years, I think often we have put down people who live with depression as just not having enough faith that if they would just memorize a few more verses, go to a few more Bible studies, sing a few more worship songs, confess a few sins, that depression would evaporate like that. And that is just simply not true. That is bogus. It is not true. That kind of depression is biological in, in its nature, and it can be exacerbated by the things that we go through in our lives. Absolutely, we are complex beings. We are body, soul, and spirit. But I have so much respect for people who serve God when it doesn't feel good. Listen, I really, really believe that people who continue to choose to stay even though it never feels good to follow Christ. I don't know if you've ever met anybody. Maybe you're one of those people. If you were being totally honest, you would say, you know what, it never really feels good to follow Christ, but I do it. But it never really feels good. I have so much respect for the people who keep putting foot in front of each other day after day after day. Those are some of the most courageous Christians that I know. They follow God, not because it feels good, not because everything turns out exactly the way they want, but man, they know that God loves them, that their pain and their story matters, 
They know that they have a purpose. They know that they belong in the body of Christ, and they know they have choices. My friend Ashley, who has lived with suicidal thoughts for such a long time, told me a couple years ago, she said it would be easier to die, but it is not necessarily better. And she has chosen to stay around to see how God will use her suffering in the lives of other people. Let me ask you, or let me remind you, here are some things that you have some choices. Where can you make some choices? What are the choices that you have the power to make? You have the choice to get help. You have the choice to try one more time. You have the choice to get sober. You have the choice to take medication if needed. You have a choice to feel your feelings. You have a choice to grieve the losses. You have a choice to forgive those who have mistreated you or let you down or harmed you or disappointed you. You have a choice to nurture your mind. You have a choice to take care of your body, to eat well, to rest, to rejuvenate, to be active. You have a choice to stay here. You have a choice to stay tightly tethered to the people you love. And you have a choice to use your pain on behalf of someone else. Philippians 4.13, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. I don't know that there's anybody who can do a better job of comforting somebody who's gone through hard times than somebody who's gone through hard times. That leads us to our last thing in the hope circle. You might say, I feel useless. This is where we play the comparison game. I don't have his gifts. I don't have her skills. I don't have his intellect. I don't have her beauty. I don't have that charm and charisma that they have. I don't have the advantages that he had. I didn't grow up with the money that he had. I didn't grow up with all the way that the way was paved for her. I didn't grow up with any of that. I don't have anything really significant to contribute. And hope and God say, you are needed. You are needed in this world. Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's masterpiece. We are his poem. And he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Mental illness, depression, anxiety, men, they're thieves. They can right, rob you of your purpose and your goals and your sense of identity and the belief that you have anything significant to offer this world. And you may feel like you are always a burden rather than a blessing to the people around you. But God says you are needed. And what you have gone through, we need it. We need your story. We need what you've gone through. Because nobody can help somebody other than the person who has gone through. I should say nobody can help them better. Nobody can help a person who has struggled with alcohol than somebody who knows what it's like to drink too much and suddenly find themselves addicted to alcohol. Nobody can help somebody who has been sexually abused than somebody who has gone through the pain and the shame and the ripping of your soul and your body the way somebody else who has been sexually abused. If you've lived with crippling depression, there's nobody that can help you nearly as much as somebody who has also walked through that and knows what it's like to battle those dark thoughts and those voices that tell you that you should just leave and get out of here. There's nobody that can help as much as you can when you get healthy, when you are living in that hope, and then you come alongside somebody else who is very intensely struggling with thoughts of self-loathing, somebody who is struggling that their life has no meaning, like you who comes along with somebody who says, you know what, I don't fit anywhere. Or like somebody who says, I want to give up. Or somebody else who says, you know what, this world doesn't need me. And you can say, oh, yes, they do. Because even broken trees can produce beautiful fruit. You don't have to be perfect to help somebody. You don't have to have it all together to be a helper. You don't have to have it all together and all neatly. Like I said, that bow, that beautiful package with the big bow and that's now put over here on the shelf, and this is who I am, and, and all that's behind me now. I know you are a fellow struggler. You are a fellow journeyer, and you can help those who have walked the dark corridors of depression or the out-of-control manic episodes or the gnawing fingers of anxiety or the pull of alcohol or drugs or the suicidal thoughts that scream that death is the only way out. You know what that's like. 
and you of all people can help somebody else. No one better to offer compassion, understanding, or strong arm to lean on. God will always, 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 always use your greatest pain as your greatest ministry. The loss of my son, my greatest agony, has led to the greatest ministry of hope that I've ever had in my life. Eric Little was an Olympic runner. He said this, Circumstances may appear to wreck our lives, but God is not helpless among the ruins. I don't know what to you feel like the ruins in your life today. I don't know what it is that you feel like circumstances, maybe your own choices, maybe the things that others have done to you, maybe the things, the, maybe the depression, the anxiety, the stress, maybe, I don't know. But somewhere there might be some of you who feel like your life has been ruined from that. Circumstances may appear to ruin our lives, but God is not helpless among the ruins. So no matter where you are on that hope circle, maybe you're standing outside, maybe, honestly, you could say, you know what, I do live with a lot of hope. I know that I'm loved. I know that I have a purpose. I know that I belong in the body of Christ. I know, I know that I have choices, and I'm doing my best to make good, healthy choices, and I know that I need it. And if you feel that way and that's your experience, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. And now I would ask that you be one of those strong arms, that other people who are not in those same places can lean on. And no matter where you are, you're standing on the outside of the hope circle even. Maybe you're just barely holding on. No matter where you are, no matter what your day has looked like, no matter what your month has looked like, no matter what your life has looked like, you can leave today knowing you are loved. You matter. You belong. You have choices. And you are needed. In fact, we can't imagine life without you. Isaiah 46, 4. This is God's promise to you today. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you, and I will carry you. I will sustain you, and I will rescue you. Father, I pray for these um, men and women here that are in this room today and those watching online. I'm so grateful that you can see into our hearts, you get past all of our defenses, you get past all the stuff on the external, all the stuff on the outside, all the ways that we can fool other people, not necessarily trying to be fake, but just not knowing how to be real, that we are completely, you can see it all. And even though you see it all, you don't run from us in fear. You don't run screaming because what you see is so terrible. You, you love us with an everlasting love. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for making that way. Thank you, God, that our lives are not meaningless, that we're not just scattered in this universe as random specks of molecules, but that you have a purpose for us. I thank you that we fit and belong. I pray for all those who today... This is just such a deep thing for them, and they feel so alone, so disconnected. I pray that they would reconnect, that there'd be somebody that would reach out to them, somebody that they would reach out to, and they would be met with grace and kindness and tenderness. Thank you, God, that we do have choices. I pray for any student struggling with suicidal thoughts, person who is believing somewhere deep in their heart that their family or even they would be better off if they weren't here anymore. Keep them tethered, please, God, to life and to people that love them and to believing that you do have a purpose and that they are needed, desperately needed in this world, that they would bring their gifts of love and compassion and caring, kindness in a world that so desperately needs all of those things. Thank you for hope. Thank you that it's real, that it's gritty, it's sturdy, it's dependable. May it grow deep in the hearts of these men and women. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Hey, Warren, thank you so much. Uh, I want us to just to take just a couple of minutes. I, I have just a couple of questions for Ms. Warren. And, um, but, but thank you for your prayer at the end, and thank you for the content of, of that presentation and for sharing your own experience with Matthew. Okay, here, my first question is, uh, you know, given the reality, no, I'm going to sit with you. Okay. <laughs> Give, given the reality of um, the, the numbers of people here and the statistics that you cited about, you know, how often all of us feel depressed or have, uh, uh, you know, as we say, you know, not, not, my aunt used to write a letter occasionally to my mother and she would say, well, I'm feeling a little blue today. And that was an older expression, if you feel blue. Uh, so wh what are some of the things that either I should watch for in myself? And you, you talked about some of these phrases. Or, or something I can watch for in a friend of mine sure. that's a warning sign. Sure. I, I mean, and I'm, I'm so glad to get the opportunity to just say everybody feels depressed. Everybody feels anxious. Everybody feels worried. If you have a big test coming up, it's normal to feel some anxiety. If you think you're going to get fired from your job, or you do, it's normal to feel some sadness or grief. So those are human emotions, and, and there's, that, there's nothing wrong or, oh my goodness, that's, that's scary. That's called being a human being. What, what happens when it moves toward depression or where it's problematic or anxiety is when, um, it, when it starts affecting your life, when you're having trouble doing your classes, when you have trouble keeping relationships, when you're having a difficult time going to work. In other words, it starts to impact your mm. work, your relationships, um, your, your health. If you can't get out of bed, that's depression. That's a significant depression. If, um, if you can't eat for three days before a test, that's a pretty significant level of anxiety. So it's as things, you know, we move from the normal human emotions that we all experience, sadness, grief, pain, anxiety, worry, fear, anger, we feel all those things. But when those emotions start to impact your daily life, and daily life is getting harder. So if you notice a friend who maybe they are the extrovert and they start isolating and they don't want to really talk to anybody, they don't want to go, they don't want to go to see a movie, they don't want to hang out, they, they want to just kind of stay in the room. That's something to pay attention to. Somebody eats too much. I'm, I'm talking about like suddenly, something changes. Like, so they're not eating hardly at all or they're eating too much. They're sleeping too little or they're not sleeping at all or maybe somebody who's normally kind of easygoing is just really like sharp and they're irritable and everything sets them off. And um, so when you start seeing those kinds of things, either in yourself, if it's in yourself, reach out to somebody else. If you see it in a friend, that's the moment to say, hey, I noticed you just haven't seemed yourself lately. Uh, I'm kind of, are, are you okay? Hmm. And ask that the are you okay question. Hmm. And, um, and sometimes people will say, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, it's just, it's just this, it's just that. If, it, if you keep seeing it, come back again and just say, hey, I've just really noticed that you know, I'm just worried about you. And um, even if people don't accept our offers of help, to know that you cared enough about them to notice that something changed, something's mm. different, mm. Um, that goes a long way in feeling cared for. And then if this, you know, I know you have counseling services and services here on the campus, you know, say, hey, listen, I'll go with you over to, sorry, I don't know what it's called here, right. but um, yeah. I'll, I'll walk with you over to the counseling center. I'll walk with you to talk to this professor that, you know, is a really empathetic person. Mm. So in other words, don't leave people alone in their struggle and watch for changes and ask just those questions. Are mm. you okay? Persist there, yeah, that's, that's, that's excellent. One, one more, uh, now let's, if I'm, uh, if, if I'm the one um, who's, who's depressed and, uh, and people, I've got some friends who are talking to me but I don't wanna talk to them and I just can't, can't do that. Who are some, are there some, you know, whether it's minister, spirit, you know, who are the, what are the options for me to go find somebody to talk to? Well, um, I think all of us, there's a really excellent program I, that it's called Sources of Strength, and it uses the example, like you're, if you could see your life and you would divide it like into maybe eight spokes, and each of us have sources of strength in our lives that often we just need to have them pointed out to us. So a source of strength for you might be your family. Now, for some of you, your family is not particularly a source of strength for you because there's a lot of conflict or a lot of drama there, but for some people that is a source of strength. Maybe it would be the presence of a caring adult. That could be a professor, 
It could be a coach. It could be a school employee here. There's somebody here that you think, you know, that person always smiles at me, always makes me feel like I'm cared for. Maybe it could be you have connections, good connections with your medical doctor. Maybe it could be um, you've got access to a pastor or a church friend. In other words, kind of just take a look at your own life and, and look through ahead of time and just say, okay, so who are my sources of strength? Who are the people that if I got into a hard time or a hard place, these are the people I would call? What friends? What are the ones that I think are dependable and who aren't going to just like push me off or, you know, basically tell me that they don't have time for me? Identify for yourself so that if you get into one of those hard places or something happens and you know that you just need some extra support, you've already done a little bit of thinking through who are my sources of strength. Mm. Obviously, your faith, if you're a believer and you have a strong walk with Jesus, that would be one of those pies, if you will, in, in your, on the wheel of, of your life. Mm. You said so much today, and uh, you know, I've, I've, as in listening, I've been reminded how important it is that relationships are so, so valuable. We, if we get isolated, that's a warning sign. When we have needs, uh, talk to friends, talk to clergy, a spiritual director, uh, a, a counselor, uh, etc. So... Uh, can I just say Please one thing? do. Just to sum that part up, everybody struggles. Don't struggle alone. Mm. Mm. Everybody struggles. Mm. Just don't struggle alone. Would you join me in thanking Kay Warren again? <laughs> God bless.